All right. So some terminology, right, to keep in mind over here. Like I said, there is a distinction between the sample clock and the system clock. Typically for resource shared implementations, the system clock is going to be faster. Right? There is also this term, term iteration, right, which you are familiar with in different contexts so far over here. Pretty much what we are talking about is exactly the same meaning of iteration as in general data flow graphs, right? And what I'm basically saying is that, you know, one iteration of this folded system corresponds to one full set of computations of all the nodes in the graph. Okay. So for example, in the previous case that one A, A of zero plus B of zero plus C of zero, giving one Y of zero output completes one iteration. Clock phase, what are the phases that we had over there? It's basically the number of different counter, uh, number of different values that can be given as input to the multiplexer, right? And the term commutator or multiplexer or switch, those are all different terms that you might come across for that switch, right? Which basically sort of uh, decides which input, which value goes to which wire, okay? And the term commutator, in fact, has a slightly specific meaning. It's usually used in order to talk about something which undergoes some kind of a rotating, you know, periodic pattern. Right? And all of these switches, ultimately, the way that we are looking them at least, uh, are periodic uh, switches. Right? They go through the same pattern in a repetitive manner. Okay. So, what I am going to do uh, after this is essentially get into a slightly more detailed analysis of one example uh, circuit, right, which is a sort of a second order filter structure, right, which involves a fair amount of computation. There are like fair amount meaning that, you know, it's, it's small by the standards of what is normally uh, done for uh, signal processing systems. It is just basically, you know, four multiplications, four additions. But one of the things that we need to sort of pay particular attention to over there is how do these different operations get scheduled one after the other? And more importantly, when I have some kind of uh, dependency in the graph, right? That is, there is some uh, node whose output is being used by some other node. What does that imply for the various different uh, you know, the scheduling instance or the time instance at which different operations can happen in the actual system. Okay. So for that, I'm going to consider once again, an even simpler example than the earlier, you know, A plus B plus C, just a sort of two node system, right? There is a, uh, one node U, which is doing some computation and its output is going to another node V, which is doing some other computation. Now I'm going to assume over here, that U and V can be executed on the same type of hardware. Okay. And this will become clear later because you know you will see that I'm essentially thinking of uh, the sort of time diagrams that I draw later will basically show that U and V are alternating on the same hardware. Now, this is strictly speaking, not even necessary. Even if they were on different hardware, the analysis that I'm showing over here will hold true. Right? In general, is it valid to sort of assume that U and V can be executed on the same type of hardware? It depends on your context. In the present case, I'm sort of leaning more towards the kind of applications where let's say that, you know, U and V can both be executed on, let's say, a DSP processor or a CPU, right, by writing an appropriate function. On the other hand, if U was a multiplication and V was an addition, then let's say that the hardware that I have chosen is a multiplier, then a multiplier cannot add two numbers. Okay. So it would basically lead to a problem if I tried to schedule both under the same type of hardware. Okay. So that is the context in which I mean that U and V can be executed on the same type of hardware. It's not absolutely essential. This assumption can be relaxed without really changing any of the analysis, but it makes it a bit simpler for me. 
I am further going to assume that T u and T v are the time instants at which u and v are scheduled. Okay. Now, what does that mean? I am further going to assume that this is basically some kind of an n phase clock, n phase system. Right. So, in other words, I have this multiplexer going zero, one, up to n minus one. Right. And there are various inputs coming in. One output, okay. And effectively, what it means is that this hardware unit that I have over here, right, in order to compute u, right, so at some t u value over here, I would then go through and at t u, u is scheduled. And at some other time instant, T V V is going to be scheduled on the same hardware. Okay. So this n phase system essentially means that I have n different possibilities within which I could schedule U and V. There are n different clock cycles in which U or V could be scheduled. And the question that I'm interested in answering is, what kind of constraints do I have on T u and T v? Can they just take any arbitrary values, of course, in the range 0 to n minus 1, or are there constraints on what must happen? Okay. I'm further going to assume that I have a hardware unit which is capable of executing this, which has a latency given by T u. Okay. What that basically means is, there is going to be some hardware which let's say that I have a timeline over here 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let's say the latency is 2. Right? Then what I'm saying is if I give in over here and out over here. I give input number 0 at this point, right, and the corresponding output is going to come here, two clock cycles later, okay. But I am also going to assume that I can give input 1 over here and I will get the corresponding output here, okay. So this is sort of implicitly assuming. this system is pipelined okay. because if it was not pipelined then until I have got out 0 I cannot give in 1 okay. but I am sort of assuming over here for the time being that yes I can actually do this. Now what if it was not pipelined then basically what that means is if it was not pipelined then I still have this latency I give input 0 and only after 2 clock cycles I get output 0. The only difference is input 1 could not have been given immediately after that at time 1. I would have to wait until either time 2, assuming that you know, I mean, out uh, it, it's coming out at time 2, and I can now give it a new input at that point, right? Uh, if the initiation interval, in other words, right, in this case, I'm assuming is equal to 1. If it was not equal to 1, then that would in turn determine when the next operation could happen on the same hardware. But once again, like I said, the main thing as far as our dependency analysis is concerned right now is just to find out the relationship between TU and TV. And for that, I don't even care about whether the hardware is pipelined or not. I only care about its latency, P, subscript U. Okay. And the constraint that that applies is TV must be greater than or equal to TU plus PU. Okay. This is sort of a very natural and intuitive thing to understand. All that I am saying is, V can start executing only after U has completed. When does U complete? Well, U started at time TU. It had a latency of PU. So, TU plus PU is the time when it finishes. TV can start any time after that. Okay. So, let us take an example over here. right? 
once again you know the top line over there that i have drawn is just time 0 1 2 3 4 5 and so on the second line is actually the phase of the clock right so i've used the symbol phi to indicate phase right and what the phase of the clock is doing is it's alternating between 0 and 1 right and this is an example where n is equal to 2 okay. so that's why it's basically going 0 1 0 1 0 1 alternating Okay. And I'm further going to make a very simple assumption that PU is equal to 1. right? So I don't have problems with latency versus initiation interval and so on. PU is equal to 1. It simply means that if I give an input, the output is ready on the next clock cycle. And I can also give it a new set of inputs on that next clock cycle. Okay. So the simple way to think about this would be if I had an adder that's followed by a register, that would exactly have this kind of behavior, right? It would be a simple computation followed by a register that stores the data. Okay. So what would the pattern look like, right? At time zero, I could basically execute operation U0. That is the zeroth instance of operation U. So this happens at time tu. So tu, in other words, remember it's between 0 to n minus 1. In this case, what I'm saying effectively is tu is equal to 0. So u0 happens at time equal to 0. And at time 1, I have v0. This basically corresponds to tv equal to 1. OK? If I go forward, once again, u1 then happens immediately after that. This corresponds to tu equal to 0. Even though capital T is now equal to 2, if I look at the phase of the clock, that corresponds to 0. And that is what I am writing over here, right? So the Tu equal to 0 corresponds to the phase of the clock. But now, effectively, what I am saying is this is now iteration 1 of the system. right? So the U0 and V0, which happened within this 0 to 1, this combination basically corresponded to iteration 0. The V1 then happens the TV equal to 1 corresponding to iteration 1. And in general, what I can say is, you know, I can sort of demarcate over here as the different iterations that I have, right? U0, V0, U1, V1, and so on. Okay. So, on the other hand, let's say that I tried doing the opposite schedule. Right, so what have I done over here? I have basically done V0 followed by U0. Okay. So in other words, I scheduled V0 into with this value TV equal to 0 and I gave U as TU equal to 1. So whenever the phase of the clock is equal to 0, the V operation will get executed. Whenever the phase of the clock is equal to 1, the U operation will get executed. There is a problem here. This violates the dependency dependency v0 requires the output of u0 that's basically what i had drawn in the graph right and the way that i have drawn it now it shows that there is a violation of that dependency numerically you can look at the bottom of the uh, slide it essentially shows that tv must and tv was expected to be greater than or equal to tu plus pu that condition is not satisfied that is where this dependency is getting violated and therefore this particular uh, sequence where the V happens before U is problematic in this case. Okay. Now, so far so good. That was the case when I simply had U with an edge to V. What if I had a slightly different situation where there is a U with an edge to V but now there is a delay element on it. What does this delay element do? It basically says that, you know, if I draw out the actor firing sequence, it's effectively telling me that the U0 output is used by V1 instead of V0 that was earlier using it. U1 is used by V2 and so on. Okay. And if I now draw this same graph, what I'll find is that the timeline basically starts to look something like this, right? I now have V0 then u0. But there's no problem over here because there is no dependency between v0 and u0. Right? Earlier there was. 
Now, if I look further down the timeline at capital T equal to 2, once again I have phi is equal to 0 and the operation that is scheduled then is V1. Right? Is there a dependency between V1 and something before it? Yes, it depends on U0. But U0 just happened in the previous clock cycle, so it's perfect. Right? There's no dependency violation over here. Right? I go further down in time, I basically find that okay, U1 happens at time t equal to cap, uh, capital T equal to 3. That has no dependence on V1. Okay? In fact, I mean if you look at U1 in the original data flow graph, it's a source, so there are no input dependencies on it. But U1 output is used by V2, which is scheduled in time instant 4. So everything is actually working out quite well. I have a perfect sort of balance between the time that an operation is scheduled and when its inputs are ready. Now look at this slightly different scenario over here, where I have basically scheduled u0 corresponding to u equal to 0 and u1 corresponding to tv equal to 1, right? And then alternating u1, v1, u2, v2 and so on. The question is, is this a valid way of scheduling it? Is there any problem with this approach? Right? And the answer is, actually there is no problem with the approach. This is perfectly valid. There is nothing wrong with this. Okay. What does that mean? But however, there is one small catch over here, something that you need to think about. Right? What is it? The output of u0 is going to be used by v1. Right? So if I look at this, basically what I see is the output of u0 is being used by v1. Similarly, the output is of u1 is being used by v2. Right? So from a dependency point of view, there is no problem at all over here. Right? The data are present. They are exactly at the, you know, they are available at the time needed. Right? Yeah, there is no sort of anti-causal dependency over here. On the other hand, the problem seems to be that U0 got computed very early, right? which basically says that I now have the value of U0, I need to store it until V1 is ready to accept it and do something with it. Because in the next clock cycle after U0, what is happening is V0, which doesn't need the value from U0. Okay? So effectively, in other words, what this is telling me is that I need some storage, I need some kind of a buffer or some place where I can keep the values of u0 until such time as the corresponding next stage which is using that value is ready to consume it. Okay. So the way to think about that would basically be I can you know rewrite this in terms of let me just erase this. So effectively what I have in other words is, for this picture I have Tu is equal to 0, Tv is equal to 1 and of course I had my original latency was equal to 1, the capital N that is the repetition period over here is equal to 2. Okay, And the constraint that was needed was T of, if I effectively think about it, Tv, that is, uh, let, let me write it in a slightly different way. The time instant of V1 must be greater than or equal to finish of U0, right? which is equal to T of U0 plus Tu. Okay. Now, what is T of V1? This is equal to basically T of V0, right? the time when V0 was scheduled, plus N. Why N? Because it takes N clock cycles right, to finish one iteration. Basically this. Corresponds to n equal to 2. Right? 
iteration. Each of these is one iteration. Okay. So if I substitute all of this, then basically what I end up with is that T of V0 plus N must be greater than or equal to T of U0 plus Vu. Okay. Which I can basically write as Tv. This is the same as T of V0. Must plus n must be greater than or equal to Tu plus Pu. Okay. In this case, in the present diagram, if I go ahead and you know look at the numbers and put it down, basically what I have is 1 plus 2 greater than or equal to 0 plus 1. Okay. Which of course is true, right? So 3 greater than or equal to 1. True, but I have to store this difference, right? Go back to this diagram. Basically, what as you as I said over here, if the output of u zero was being used immediately by v zero in the next clock cycle, then everything is fine, right? I don't need. I already have the output of u zero going into a register, and in the next clock cycle is being used by v zero, but that's not when it's being used. It's being used two clock cycles later by v one. So I can actually rewrite this and define a term called df for the edge u to v and say that this is going to be equal to the value n plus tv minus tu plus tu, right? Why n? Because of one delay element on the u to v, okay? And if I look at this, this basically comes out to be the value 2 plus 1 minus 0 plus 1 is equal to 2. This is the number of registers to store u output. 